and I think we're good to go. Right. Jim, quick question uh, to start off. Why journalism? Of all the things you could have done 50 years ago when you were making your choices, why did you choose journalism? Or did it choose you? Actually, it wasn't that hard a choice. I had been studying, you know, I, I was studying to be a doctor for all the wrong reasons. And I really didn't have a knack for it. I really didn't like the people who were sitting next to me in class. They were ruthless and they wanted to get ahead of you. And if you outscored them on a test, you were ostracized from the study groups as they all fought so hard to, you know, get that degree. It was a guarantee of success, huh? And I had gone to a counselor and said, I don't know what to do. Uh, I don't really want to do this anymore. And they said, well, you have no extracurricular activities. And so I decided that I could be a DJ, a rock and roll DJ. I mean, this is 19, what, 72. And uh, so I went to the radio station. I said, hey, I'm here. I want to be a DJ. I want to spin those rock and roll tunes on the college radio station. And they said, well, guess what? So does everybody else. There's a line that you, you wouldn't even get up that list by the time you graduate. So, but they said, look, we could put you in the newsroom and you could do the news and then we'll push you up the list. Well, that was a trick. Obviously it was a trick because I got into the newsroom and I never got out for my entire life. And it was because I found something that engaged me. Put this in perspective. When I started doing that, we were in the middle of the Vietnam War. There were protests on campus on a weekly, if not daily basis against the war. So it was something you could become involved in where you could proclaim I, I don't know any Vietnamese. Why would I want to kill one? And so it got me involved in that. And it got me covering the story, talking about young people, talking about our concerns about being drafted into the military. That was before the draft. And if you dropped out of college, uh, you went to the army and you went to Vietnam. And so there was a lot of people, there were a lot of people at university simply because they didn't want to be in Vietnam, holding a gun, sloshing through the jungle. And that's the way I got into it. I found something that I really loved. Uh, I, I found something that really made me feel empowered and really made me feel like I was doing something that my life would have some meaning. Now, I never expected to make any money, right? Uh, but at the same time, it was fulfilling. And that's how I got into journalism. And... Um, did, did you have a trajectory at that point or an idea of where you wanted to go um, after you joined that initial newsroom? Not really, although there was a rock and roll station uh, in the city, the number one station, KFML, and uh, I wanted to work for them. Uh, their news director uh, got in a fight with them and he left. And I dropped out of college at that point and decided this is the only chance I'll ever have to work in free form radio, which was really a hippies. Everybody's free to play whatever they want. There's no playlists. And they had a lot of different shows. It was really a great station. It was both AM and FM. So I took that job for a whopping $50 a week. And I mean, that was barely enough to survive on, barely enough to survive on. And, uh, so I started working for them and then that lasted about a year and a half, two years. And uh, then I decided San Francisco was all the rage at that point. You know, it had been since the late 1960s. And I wanted to get to San Francisco because some of the disc jockeys at KFML had worked in San Francisco and they talked about it in glowing terms. And so I wanted to get to San Francisco too. And I went out there and ran up against a brick wall ran up against a brick wall. But after a year of knocking on the door of KCBS radio, uh, the all news radio station owned and operated by CBS. After a year of doing that, they finally gave me a job based on nothing else, but they said sheer determination. You know, you've been here knocking on the door. I was selling stereos and radios and stuff at a, uh, an electronic store down on Kearney Street in San Francisco's financial district in the meantime. And this was at one Embarcadero Center, uh, right there in the financial district by the, uh, uh, the very famous landmarks of, of San Francisco, um, like the Ferry Building, you know, with its clock tower. 
So it was a very romantic place to be. And that's where I really learned news because they had standards and they had a real background of news. And I got a lot of news training there on writing. They had some brilliant writers. I remember one year uh, we had a story and the story was that all the toys for tots uh, toys had been stolen. And so we wrote up this story at Christmas time that somebody is, you know, all the toys for tots toys have been stolen out of a warehouse. And isn't this terrible? And then along came, we wrote up our story and it was good. But I remember Frank Knight coming up to me and he says, you want to see a lead? Take a look at this story. And it was written by his name escapes me now, very famous CBS News correspondent. And the story began, San Francisco police are looking for the meanest man in the world. That's a lead. That's how you write a news story. And, you know, I absorbed that. I absorbed that and I did investigations. I was trying to become a reporter, obviously. I was working on, on the assignment desk, trying to become a reporter. And uh, I found that it, was just as easy to go after the big stories as it was to go after the little ones. And so I took a story that nobody was making any progress on, a group called the New World Liberation Front that were attacking city supervisors. And I actually went to that group and tried to engage them, engage with them and do reporting on them. Well, this culminated maybe a year later. I mean, I had amassed an incredible amount of information about them. And this resulted in me really uh, knowing who the people inside were. And when the group fell apart, must have been two years later, I was the guy that knew everything about them. I was the guy that knew that so-and-so had been the cellmate of this other guy who was arrested down near Santa Barbara with the brains of his girlfriend in a plastic bag, muttering incoherently. So it was a great story. And then I moved on. Uh, from radio and got into television. And uh, there we did the story about Jim, Jim Jones and the People's Temple. And it was the story of a religious leader who was an absolute charlatan and fraud who did fake faith healings. <coughs> Excuse me. And we, we got some photos and videos and testimony of what happened. And I didn't break the story, but I got a lot of this data that proved the case against him. And then I had a news director at that, at that television station who was committed to the story and gave me six, seven minutes a night to report on. A lot of time. <laughs> yeah, you don't get that often. And your journey through television led you to network. Um, when CNN came calling, um, did you have to think about it or, or was it a natural progression for you? Well, ironically, the man who had been the news director that gave me that six, seven minutes a night, Ted Kavanaugh, was one of the founders of CNN. And he came to me and said, you should join up. We'll pay you $15,000 a year. Well, I mean, I'm making fifty thousand dollars a year in local television. Uh, so it wasn't that attractive. What made it much more attractive was when I got fired for insubordination, you know, because I didn't care for my assignment editor who had told me to uh, report on a story on a Friday when everybody else wanted to go home <laughs> to report on a story that wasn't a story. <clears throat> so long and short of it, I ended up at CNN. And uh, it was a very fast transformation. I only expected it to last for a few months and it turned into 35 years. Wow. So, and CNN became my home. CNN was a family. And what I really wanted to do was foreign corresponding. And CNN offered me that. And, and you went all across the world, you were, in, in Africa for a sustained period of time. Um, which, which region of the world did you find the most compelling to live and work in? Uh, the one that was in turmoil. Whenever, whenever it happened, uh, 
however it happened, wherever it happened, we would parachute in. And we became very good at that, at covering the story in that manner uh, and, and trying to bring the world up to date. There was nothing else like CNN International. We were the ones who were taking media and reporting across borders. And the dictatorships of the world could do nothing to s- stop it. I mean, they could ban the satellite dishes, but people would find ways and people would get the information. So it was a very exciting time uh, to be doing that. By the time, I mean, never did a live shot from Lebanon, never. Uh, At least in the first years that I was there covering the civil war, because it was too dangerous, uh, too dangerous because somebody could take over your, your live shot. And in those days you had a huge amount of equipment, huh? People thought about putting the satellite gear in Lebanon on board a ship in the harbor to give it more security. And then it was decided that that won't work because it's just like the old adage, if you want security, well, you know, you get an AK-47. Well, if you get an AK-47, they get a B-7 rocket launcher. I mean, they can always out-escalate you. So nobody did live shots for that reason. But we did a lot of reporting. You fast forward that then... 10, 15 years, and I can do a live shot basically with a small briefcase size satellite phone and this computer. And when I get to that point, you know, camera, of course, but when I get to that point, I can go anywhere and I can pack it up and leave. So I have more security. I also have more risks because I could actually give away battlefield information. And see, you don't want to be seen as the guy that's working for one side or another. In journalism, when you're in those conflict situations, you have to be very careful to ensure you're the guy that's just standing in the middle. You're telling the story of the people that are going through this. Uh, The battlefield updates were one thing, but at the same time, how that conflict was affecting the civilians caught in the crossfire was the bigger story. It was in many ways, the safer story and the more relevant story. Because as anybody can tell you that's been to war, it is the civilians that suffer first and they suffer suffer the worst of the atrocities that are carried out. So things just progressed from there. And uh, we became better and better and better at being able to go live from any spot around the world and do it over the internet. The internet changed everything, just changed everything in the news business. We used to pay literally tens of thousands of dollars to ship satellite dishes around the world to try to cover these stories. And a satellite dish is an effective way to do it. And they got smaller, but they were still huge. And when you can pack that down to a suitcase, you got something. And was there ever a point in your career where you thought, oh, no, I might not get out of this at all? Oh, several, several. And I mean, um, (laughs) there's no accounting for stupidity. I mean, I remember one time in the Democratic Republic of Congo, then Zaire, and the Rwandan army defeated was hiding out in Zaire in this jungle camp. And we went to interview the, um, the, the general who was in charge of the troops and he wasn't available, he was resting. And all of the troops were washing their clothes on a line. And they told us, I mean, these guys are huge. And they told us, machetes in hand, they said, don't you be taking any pictures of us, okay? And they told us, all right, the guy isn't here. Or he's not available. You can come back later. So we go back to the car and uh, we parked a little bit down the road. And as we're getting in, I tell the cameraman, just shoot over my shoulder here. You know, and I'll stand in the way so they can't really see you. They saw us right away. They were watching. And then I've got 300 screaming guys. Well, it seemed like 300. I, I really didn't count at that point. We just got in into the car, threw it in reverse, went as fast as we possibly could with this mob with machetes coming towards us. And as we, after we stuffed our hearts back down our throats, we managed to get out of there. But yeah, usually you get into trouble because you've done something stupid. That was stupid. It wasn't worth the shot. Uh, at the same time, you have to analyze 
When do people die in conflicts? 66% of all the casualties are in the first 24 hours someone has arrived in country. Why? Because they don't know where they are. They don't know what streets are safe. They don't know who is in control here, who is in control there, where there's a hot zone in conflict between two sides. So one of the things you learn is, number one, talk to your colleagues. Number two, slow down. Just slow down and get to know the place a little bit before you go walking out there. That's really valuable uh, insight in, into how you cover these conflicts because you can die and people do die. People get enthusiastic, they get carried away and hey, guilty as charged. I've done it. Uh, it's dangerous. <coughs> and um, what would you say, you mentioned the internet as being a massive uh, game changer for journalism. Um, in, in your career, but what other things, what other aspects of journalism have completely transformed over your 50 years in broadcasting? Well, the, the sheer size and weight of the equipment. Uh, the equipment early on was very heavy. Uh, even when we got to, I remember I started shooting film, 16 millimeter film uh, in television. And, you know, you had to rush into the laboratory, you had to push it. Uh, you had to do all kinds of it by increasing the exposure so it could go through faster. All of these things when we started out and sound was a problem. You know, the whole term of B-roll, we talk about B-roll all the time in television, but people don't realize that that was an old film thing where you had, a, you had chains of film on different reels and there was an A-roll and there was a B-roll. The A-roll was your videotape. Your B-roll was the images that would cover sound and then your sound would be cut onto uh, the A-roll. And so that's where the word B-roll came from. And it was very clumsy. I mean, you could cut a minute and 30 second spot in probably 20 minutes if you had an excellent editor. But remember, you've got to go through, it's got to come in, it's got to go into processing, it comes out of processing and then all of that is drawn together. And a great editor will be able to do something with that very quickly. They go through and they just cut shots out of it, physically cut it, and then hang those strips of uh, film uh, from a rack, pull them out when they need to put them in. So then when you went to video, it became easier, but video was actually three times as heavy or more than film because the CP16 camera that was the standard fit on your shoulder and it weighed maybe 15 pounds, um, if that. Whereas then you got into the first video cameras, they were very heavy and they were attached by an umbilical cable to an even heavier sound uh, deck. And so, you know, we saw the, the gear get lighter and lighter and lighter, and that made us more and more mobile. It also enabled us to go more places because you could actually go to a place now with a small plane rather than going in with a big airliner. I mean, it would be nothing for us to travel uh, with uh, 100 cases, 150 cases that would include the added gear and, and everything else. The, just your LCD screen on your computer. Imagine if you had to carry two CRT monitors that weigh about 20 pounds each just for the edit pack. And then the edit machines might weigh another 60, 70 pounds a piece, and you needed at least two of those probably three because if one broke down. So it became lighter and lighter over time. The internet changed everything because now I can access all of this information. And now I can use, and I wrote programs that would interface with our Basies news system. Basies carried the wires. Basies carried the messages uh, inside the company. And you could access all these different files <laughs> so that's what we would do by computer and as a result of the internet having that access what would you say has been a highlight or one of the or one of the highlights of your career oh there's been so many um you know you you look at the fall of the wall uh, that was certainly big i it, it, the velvet revolution in uh, Czechoslovakia, then Czechoslovakia in 1989 uh, was huge. Uh, 
uh, as I said, even in the earlier days, bringing down Jim Jones, driving him out of San Francisco with his, you know, fake faith healing and, and all of that. That was a, a big moment for me. Um, there were all kinds of stories that matter. Rwandan genocide, uh, covering that story and understanding it, understanding what was going on, because I had been covering it. I think one of the things that I'm most proud of is Inside Africa. It is the longest running program on CNN International. Uh, and it celebrates 20 years this year uh, of, of being on the air. And it was designed originally to show some good news about Africa, to show uh, the reality of the continent. And the whole concept for doing this was really gleaned from seeing how Africa is covered. Uh, I think uh, there was a Ugandan prime minister in Sibamba who told me that, you know, I go home at night and he says, I sit in my bedroom and I watch CNN and I just pray to God. I pray to God that Uganda won't be on your show, won't be on the news, because I know if it is something absolutely horrible will have happened. And that's the way that Africa was always perceived. There had to be a major famine. There had to be death and destruction. There had to be some cataclysmic, biblically proportioned event had to happen for Africa to make the news. And I thought, that's, should, that's not right. They should be covered like everyone else. And uh, that was the original you know, foundation of Inside Africa, the original purpose. And Chris Kramer of CNN International uh, made it possible. Who's been your toughest interviewee, your toughest interview? You know, sometimes your toughest interview can be the guy you like, the <laughs> person you admire. Uh, you know, people like to talk, what was your best interview? And, you know, I would say, well, that was Václav Havel. But, <laughs> and this, I, you know, we're, on, we're off the record here, kids. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, and he and I are personal friends. I hosted uh, a fundraiser for him in Berlin on the 25th anniversary of the fall of the wall. And uh, we're good friends. But when you go to interview him, strict rules, you only have 12 minutes. And, you know, he has that bald guy with him that does his translation all the time. And uh, they work as a tag team match. You ask a question and uh it's a good question. You've made it sharply focused. And Gorbachev will reply and say, oh, you, that's not really the question. And then he begins his long speech, Politburo speech, whatever you want to call it. And it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. And you're looking at the clock. You're going, we're up to eight minutes here. I've got 11 total. I, ha I haven't gotten my question in yet. You go to interrupt politely as possible. And... Then the translator turns to you and goes, shh, 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 this is very important. So you're stuck with him. The <laughs> other the other one, but I, I love Gorbachev, and, and he's been a, a terrific, I mean, he's a man who's helped change the world. Uh, I know the Russians don't love him so much, but I think we in the West do. The other one that's, that was really tough is Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa, you, you go and your editors all think, you know, you're going to talk to the Dalai Lama or you're going to talk to Mother Teresa. We're going to hear the secrets of the universe. We're going to hear some grand <laughs> thing that comes out of this. No, she doesn't like to give interviews and she'll just give you the no. And they're, they're tough interviews to do. And uh, you end up with uh, God bless you all and all those kinds of things. And, you know, I'm the last guy in the world that's going to criticize Mother Teresa. I'm just saying she's not a great interview. <laughs> uh, <coughs> before we finish, we've got we've got incredible um, pollen here. I mean, it covers all the cars. We're blanketed in this stuff, this light green pollen. Which is more I'm, challenging. I'm surprised I had a sneezing fit. Pollen it's not coronavirus. I just want you to know. <laughs> if you had to pick half an hour trying to get an answer out of Mother Teresa or dealing with pollen, which would you pick? Yeah, well, it would be a tough call. 
I, I, you just have to recognize you're not going to get anything. I, I mean, you, you interview the Dalai Lama and you're going to get life is a long road. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> what? So what you think is one thing is not the same as another. What advice do you have for those who are entering journalism now and broadcast journalism? What words of wisdom do you have But before we finish up? Get a story. You know, get your foot in the door. Yes. Be persistent. Get your, get your foot in the door at a place where you think you can learn something. You know, um, I probably didn't learn anything working as the one man news department of a rock and roll radio station. Now, having said that, I did have a lot of fun. All right. But I learned a tremendous amount by working in a larger news organization like CBS and being alongside some really good journalists who were kind enough to share a lot of their wisdom and technique with me. But through all of that, what happens in journalism too often is the older people get a little tired of being the ones to go out there and I got to go dig this up. It very rare are the people that all throughout their career, they go out and they dig stories every day. You've got to dig stories every day and you have to look for the stories, you step back and take a look at the stories. What's being reported? What isn't? Why is that happening? You know, um, one thing leads to another. I, when I was working in San Francisco for KCBS, I saw that every day somebody was murdered inside San Quentin prison, day after day after day. So I actually took a tape recorder, went out to the prison and talked to the prisoners. And believe me, that was no easy feat to arrange. It took more than a month to get that all lined up. And what I found out from the inmates, it was the indeterminate sentence where they were sentenced to five to life, no matter what the crime, five to life. And they said, what happens is you have no light at the end of the tunnel. You're just in there. And every year you go to the parole board and they just tell you, come back and bring me another year. See what else you can do. See what, you know, join AA, read books, get a GED agree, uh, degree, all these kinds of things. Fine and God. they said it was this hopelessness. And you know what? That story was a five-part series or longer, and it ended up having the, the uh, state legislature in Sacramento change the indeterminate sentence rules. So just by looking at the news every day, you go, oh, another murder inside San Quentin prison. Uh, and then just try to put it together. Today, you have data. You have incredible data that is available to you. And doing data journalism, data-driven journalism, can be really revealing. How long do these people remain in their posts in legislatures or city councils? And what was their income when they went into public service? And what is their income today after 20 years? You'll get some enlightening things that come out of that. So those are some tips. Stay on a story. Make the story your focus, not your career. If you take care of the news, the news will take care of you. That's very, very, very good advice. Um, quick question. Um, Zainab uh, is going to, uh, for, is uh, one of our Nigerian master students. Um, and she's on the or in, in the session. Zainab, do you want to unmute and ask a quick question to Jim before we before we head off? All right. I, okay. Hi. Hi, Zain. Hi. I'd like to ask this question. How was your experience while reporting in Africa? Because a lot of people think Africa is a very dangerous place to report. So is that true? Do you think it's a very dangerous place? Well, it depends. Uh, obviously, uh, if you get caught in a conflict, uh, it can be a very, very dangerous place. This is a surprising thing. You see, you may not know this, but I'm white. And I had much less of a problem than did some of my colleagues who were black Americans, journalists. Uh, because in Africa, there's this tendency for everyone to say, oh, he's really on the side of these other guys. That's always the suspicion. They look at you as white, they're Mzungu, and they say, he doesn't know enough to be on anybody's side, okay? So there's that. On the other hand, if it ends up being a race war, uh, if they line you up against the wall, you're not going to be able to convince them you're black either. Uh, 
<laughs> so it's a dual-edged sword. There's so much, how can I describe it? Uh, there's so much competition for resources. And there are bad actors out there. I remember covering Fode Sanko's uh, group in Sierra Leone. And he was trained by Muammar Gaddafi alongside uh, the Liberians and others. And uh, Fode Sanko was truly crazy. And uh, he exhorted his followers, we want peace. Tell them we want peace. And then they chopped people's limbs off. And they tried to make themselves so so terrifying that people would surrender. Well, the strategy worked uh, in uh, Liberia and one of uh, Muammar Gaddafi's uh, acolytes uh, there, uh, Taylor, uh, managed to pull it off and became the president, whereas Fodi Sanko was rejected by the people of Sierra Leone. But they paid a terrible price for it, for standing up to him. And so, yes, it's dangerous. They drugged the children. They had them do it. You couldn't get an adult to commit these atrocities. Adult wouldn't do it because they just have a sense of what's right and wrong. Whereas the kids, 12 years old on drugs, they didn't have that sense. Uh, the most dangerous moments are when you run up against that 12 year old with an AK-47 because they don't know the value of life. You know, their lives don't mean anything. They know that much. And why would yours? Why would they think about your family at home? Uh, they just don't do it. They don't take it into, into account. And so you have to be very, very careful what you say, what you do. And one of the problems in our world today is they can see you in real time. You do a report the next morning, they all know it. I remember going through the capital Mogadishu, and if they liked the report, everybody, Mr. Jim, come have tea at my house. If they didn't like the report, they just give you a sign. So you have to be careful, but it's richly rewarding. The people of Africa have a sense of community that you're not going to find anywhere else. Uh, they do value life. The, the, the adults certainly value life. And they find happiness without all of the wealth and all the toys and everything else in the West. They find happiness. And so... I wouldn't trade my experiences in Africa for anything. Yes, there was there were some moments that were tense, but I had tense moments in a lot of other places as well. And frankly, uh, I mean, when you're dealing with drunken Serbs or drunken Croats on the front lines that are armed with deer rifles and hunting knives, uh, I mean, they're drunk at eight o'clock in the morning. That's frightening. That's really frightening. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Jim, thank you very much uh, for this. I'm much appreciated. And um, the very best of luck with all of your projects moving forward. And thank you so much for sharing your insights with the University of the West of Scotland. It's much appreciated. Professor Mayen, it's been a pleasure. Good to see you again, my friend. Stay safe. Thank you. Cheers. All right. Good day. It's a wrap, as they say. The lights lasted. <laughs>